All right, now, of course, in Genesis chapter 8, we're wrapping up the, the chapters that deal with the flood. And um, here we're going to see, we basically get kind of the timeline of the events. I went over last week how a lot of people might kind of think, because they don't know the story real well, that, well, the flood lasted 40 days and 40 nights. Because that's what people are familiar with. That's what is commonly taught, you know, because it, it did rain for 40 days and 40 nights, but that's not how long the flood actually lasted. So what we see here in chapter 8, and we're not going to reread all, all of the verses um, in, in this first half, because I'm kind of going to just, just go over and we're, and we're going to cover the, this, this timeline of events. There's a couple of interesting things that we see here. Um, but just look at verse number 1. It says, And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuage. Assuage, it just means they started to decrease, they started to go away, right? So he gets to this point, you know, God is angry. He pours out his wrath. You know, the, the, the flood is just, is just prevailing upon the earth. And it's just getting higher and higher and everything dies that's on the earth. All the people, all the animals, everything. God wipes it all out in his anger and in his wrath. And this was a planned event, right? God has been long-suffering up to this point, but violence had filled the earth. People were just not listening to him. He was even sorry that he had created man. He got to this point. He knew what he was going to do, but... Noah found grace in his eyes, so he gave him some time. You know, he gave him 120 years to build this ark and, and to save him and to not just completely wipe out the entire human race and the animal kingdom and everything, just 100%. He left that remnant that was saved and, um, and provided that salvation for Noah and his family and for all the beasts um, of the earth to, to be able to be preserved. But... Um, you know, when, when the day that the flood came, when the, when, the, when the rain came, God was angry. God was pouring out his wrath on a wicked world. He was bringing his judgment forth. And people like to think, you know, oh, why would a, you know, a loving God wouldn't, wouldn't hurt people or wouldn't do it? Well, he is. He's a just God. He's a loving God. Yes, he's loving. He was long-suffering. He loved Noah. He gave him an opportunity to escape. And you know what? Noah wasn't the only one that could have had that opportunity. But he was the one that was righteous before God. He was the one that was doing right. He's the one that walked with God, just like Enoch did. And um, he found grace in the eyes of God. And, um, you know, God, God was angry and he poured out his wrath. But now we're at the point, and in chapter 8, and that's what it says when God remembered Noah, his, his, his wrath and his anger subsides. Because, I mean, he's, he's flood everything, flooded everything. I mean, that, that ark is lifted up. And you remember in chapter 7, it says, you know, the, the water is even past the highest mountains. I mean, it was, everything was underwater. Everything was submerged. I mean, God really just, just caused a huge flood upon the earth. And um, now God remembers Noah. And he's saying, okay, you know, that's all done. That's taken care of. Now let's, you know, bring things back to normal. And, and get Noah back. So then this is now when the waters start to assuage, they start to become abated, um, is another word that it uses. It just means that the, the waters start to, to decrease, go back down. Now it's kind of interesting, I don't know exactly how it worked, um, where the waters were located in the deep, when it says the fountains of the deep break, break open. But I'm guessing there's probably a lot of pressure, if it's, you know, there's some hot, um, the heat from, from the core, from the you know from lava, from hell, that was that could push the, the water out um, to to first flood the earth so that it doesn't come back down yet. And again, I don't know all of the all of the mechanics or physics behind the way it worked. I mean, obviously, God caused it to happen, and we know that it happened. The the, the ins and outs of it, I don't know, but um, it must have reached a point where the water stopped flooding up so that they would go back down in some respect, back to kind of where they were prior to the flood. But it wasn't going back immediately. Just like it, the flood didn't happen all at once. It happened over some time. It was shooting forth. There was a lot of pressure. The water's coming, and it floods. And now, he remembers Noda, and now, now the waters start to go down. And um, so if you remember the timeline, Noah was 600 years old. We saw that last week when, when this started. And um, it rains for 40 days and 40 nights. The fountains of the great deep are broken up. 
uh, the waters prevail above the highest mountains. Then when we were here in, in chapter 8, God remembers Noah, the rain stops, the fountains stop, stop from flooding the earth. After 150 days, which is five months, five months later after the flood started, the waters are abated, which means they're lowered, they're lessened. Now, it doesn't mean that they're completely gone. Um, that word abated doesn't mean that they're just, just completely, the water's all gone. Because um, we see the first time that that word abated is used it was in verse 3. It says, And the waters return from off the earth continually. So they're continually draining. The, you know, it's, it's getting smaller. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. It doesn't mean they were gone completely, but after five months, it says they were abated. They had decreased. And just within the context of the Bible, we know that abated doesn't mean gone completely because in verse 8 and 9, it says, And he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. Now, if the, if the waters were abated completely earlier, then he wouldn't be checking to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground, if they weren't, you know, reduced from off the face of the ground. It just means that they were, they were less than they had gone away. Um, so then, okay, that's five months go by. It says the waters were abated. And then after seven months is when the ark rests in the mountains of Ararat. Now, you still can't see the tops of the mountain when the, when the ark rests, right? I mean, you think of a boat, when there's big rocks, it could be right below the surface, enough for, for the ark to, to get stuck and to rest and, and to be still within those mountains. You're still not going to see the tops yet when, it, when, it's, when it's stuck. And we see that that happens after about 10 months is when he starts to see the mountaintop. So um, verse 4 says, And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat, and the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. So it takes all the way back until the 10th month before you can even see the tops of the mountains again. This is a serious flood, right? I mean, it took a long time to get to this point. So then 40 more days after this, we're in the 11th month. That's when Noah sends a raven and he also sends a dove to see if, if the ground is cleared up. He said to see if, if the earth is, has dried up yet. And of course, he sends the dove out the first time and then it returns unto him. He sends the dove out again and it returns with an olive branch in its mouth. So he knows that at least, you know, the trees are there. You can see, okay, well, the water is, has gone down pretty, pretty low if he's coming back with an olive leaf in his mouth. And then the third time, and he waits a week. So every week he sends it out. The third week he sends a dove out again and it doesn't come back to him. So at this point he knows, okay, it's not even coming back. It must be pretty good. But then he waits until the, the 601st year, first month, first day of the month, Noah removes the covering from the ark so that the ark was, was covered. I'm sure it was a rain cover so, so the water wouldn't get in and they're protected in the ark. And then, um, and then he finally ends up leaving the ark in the second month. Now, what's kind of interesting here is, is how long it takes for the water to go down before even the tops of the mountains are seen because the tops of the mountains weren't seen until the the tenth month right so the flood has been going on it stops and then on the on the tenth month you could finally see the tops of the mountains again now this makes sense and i'm going to be real real brief with this but recently i've noticed some conversations and i'll be honest with you they're kind of fun to have and, and i'm not against these things at all I think it's a fun exercise, but I've seen people debating, and, and it's going to sound really funny, okay, and, and it is kind of funny, but they debate whether or not we live on a flat earth. And I'm not kidding. I mean, a lot of, it sounds really funny for people to be talking about that, but here's why I don't think it's, it's just a complete and utter joke, because I don't think that. I, I, I like the fact that we ought to question everything. I mean, when, when you know, at first it's easy to mock and ridicule, oh, oh, oh yeah, what do you think of left flat earth? What are you from? You know, like, you don't know anything. You're an idiot. You're a fool. Now, 
that's a common response and I don't, uh, just disclosure, I don't think we live on a flat earth. Okay, but there's very good reason for that. Okay, but what they'll say is, you know, well, why do you, why, why do you believe we don't live on a flat earth? You know, and they're saying, basically they're saying that NASA is, you know, conspiring and that, and that it's all a fraud because they get so much money from the government, which, yeah, is there a motive there for them to commit fraud? Sure there is, but, um, you know, and then they'll try to use the Bible to explain why they believe it's a flat earth. Um, but like I said, I don't believe this at all. And I think this is an, actually another example that can, ex that can prove the flat earth theory wrong. Um, that's why I'm just going to be real brief on this because I know it, it's... Well, but, what I, but what I was saying is what I do like about that is that don't just accept everything that you hear just because, oh, I was in grammar school and my science textbook said that we live on a round earth and that's just the way it is. You know, like, um, there's nothing wrong with, with test challenging things and testing them and say, well, how can I prove this? And, and, and you know, there's, there's very easy ways to, to determine um, curvature and, and things like that. There's, there's mathematical formulas to do that. And then you have the problem with refraction, um, with, with um, Anyways, I, I don't want to. I don't want to get into all that. But it's a fun exercise to just to to challenge the way you think about things, so that we're not just automatically accepting everything that we see and hear, as or, or especially what we're just taught and told to be true, without having an inquisitive mind and, and challenging things and just being willing to, at least for a minute to to consider. Oh, people are saying something different. What what do they have to say? and giving it some critical thinking. So in that regard, you know, do the critical thinking. I don't think very much needs to be done for this subject. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's pretty straightforward, but it's a fun exercise. And anyways, what, what, what we see here, I think, is another example of how the Earth is truly a globe and a sphere. Because think about, it's a lot of water. The, the, the farther out away you go from the surface of the Earth in a sphere, the more volume of water you need to, to, to go higher and higher and higher because your, your, your overall volume, your, your surface area is increasing the farther away you go. And it wasn't until the 10th month then of the, of the waters coming back down before you're able to see the, the, the mountaintops again. And then once you see those mountaintops, it's like the water goes away a lot faster. Just a couple more months and, and the ground is dry. So it goes from that, you know, from, and it was, it only said it was 15 cubits up above, which I take to be above the tops of the mountains. But um, this kind of makes sense as to why it would take so long to get to that point and then go quicker, the, 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 the closer, you know, the less water there is obviously because there's less surface area. But not just that, but you think about the Bible said in chapter seven, I didn't go over this then, but um, it said all of the mountains under the whole heaven were covered. So if every th if the highest mountain under the whole heaven, if it was a flat earth, what's going to happen when the, when the water is going over the highest mountain? It's going to be, you know, going off into space or what, whatever they believe is like this, you know, it's just going to be rolling off. Because something is, they think there's like all these, uh, like the Arctic, the Antarctica like surrounds us on the flat. I, I look at this thing, it's kind of funny, but uh, you know, that there's all these just, just barren snow land that you just can't get through and then that just, just ends. And there's, they're like tall, mountainous, you know, glaciers or whatever. But if, I would consider that to be a highest mountain still too. And if that was covered by water, the water has to go somewhere. This would be pouring off unless they think that there's just a force field kind of protecting it. I don't know, I haven't, I haven't, I don't care to, to do that much research into that, that false belief of the flat earth, but um, from the Bible, I think it's pretty easy to clear. You know, the Bible says that the earth hangeth upon nothing, and it calls it the circle of the earth and things like that. But um, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to spend any more time on that than I already did. But um, I just think it's kind of interesting when we're looking through the timeline, how, you know, how much water there must have been on this earth to cover, to cover everything. And um, it's pretty intense. Now, we also don't know how tall the highest mountain was back then either. With, um, with the tectonic plate shifting, you know, mountains 
I don't, I don't know um, all of the Earth's history. If uh, you know, it's possible that mountains today are a little bit higher than they were back then. I don't know. Um, probably not, but who knows, right? Um, in any case, let's uh, let's keep going here because that's that's the timeline. It's taken basically a full year for the ground to become dry again, and he and he doesn't leave the ark until the second month. Um, Let's look at verse number 13. It says, And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, around, looked and behold, the face of the ground was dry. So now he removes the cover, he looks around, he sees, okay, the ground's dry. But then it says, In the second month, on the 7th and 20th day of the month, was the earth dried. So like, that's when everything completely dried on that the first month he was able to look around and see that the ground was dry but then it wasn't the earth didn't completely dry until that uh, that second month so verse 15 it says and God spake unto Noah saying go forth of the ark thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons wives with thee bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And um, it says, And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing and every fowl and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. So now we have this great departure out of the ark. And God's commandment unto him at that point is saying, Okay, go forth now and be fruitful and multiply. Now, if you remember, this was the same, um, the same command that God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. And obviously the earth is, is now desolate and barren and God wants the earth to be inhabited. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 45. Because we live in a society today that, that's going to try to tell you not to have kids, not to be fruitful and multiply. We have, we have a, a bunch of wicked left-wing liberals that are going to try to tell you that you know, this world's overpopulated and we need to be worried about the animals and the conservation of the planet and everything else and you need to be doing your part and, and don't have more than two kids and you know, all this other nonsense that they spew. But we're going to see what, Bi what, what the Bible says, what God thinks about us being fruitful and multiplying and about the earth. Now, the, the earth being overpopulated is a joke. It's a joke. And people will, will try to tell you that. And they can get this pushed a little bit further amongst people who live in these big metropolis cities. Right? Someone who lives in New York or in the middle of LA or the middle of Chicago might think like, oh man, yeah, there's nowhere to live. I mean, we live, there's all these condos and all these apartments and all these people and we're all crammed in together and yeah, there's no space. But go drive around this country a little bit and other countries for that matter. It's not just the United States. I mean, the United States is vast. You drive through Arizona and I mean, you just, you can go, you go through this, through this state and it's nothing but wide open. There are lots of room to grow. And God wanted us to fill the earth. He wants this earth to be inhabited. You're Isaiah chapter 45. Look at verse number 18. Chapter 18 says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain. He didn't create it for nothing. He didn't create this earth just for vanity, just for nothing. It says, He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. He didn't make this earth just so that we could just be so worried and focused about preserving the trees and preserving the animals and, and, and you know, not filling it. He says, no, I created the earth so that it would be inhabited. He didn't make the trees just for the, for the beautiful landscape and the beautiful scenery and these mountains and the sun all just for, just for beauty. He said, I created it to be inhabited. And if he wanted it to be inhabited, he wants us to use the resources. We don't need to be worried about you know, the, the, the end of the world with um, you know, people always are trying to use these scare tactics and fear-mongering tactics to tell you that 
you know, we're going to destroy ourselves and, you know, we can't be using these fossil fuels and these resources and we're polluting the air and all this other stuff. Now, look, do I think that we should just trash the world? No, of course not. But the things that we have, hey, let's use them. Let's do some work with it. Let's, 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 you know, God has given us this earth as our dominion to, to, to put under our control and to use it, and it's made to be inhabited by us. Look at Gen flip back to Genesis, look at chapter 9. We're going to jump into chapter 9 just a little bit. There's going to be a shorter sermon tonight. But Genesis chapter 9, we're going to get into the first, um, the first verse of chapter 9. We're going to see the same command again. It says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And then jump down to verse 7 of chapter 9. He says again, And you... Be ye fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. God has this. I don't believe this is changed. I don't think it's just for that time that God wanted human beings to be fruitful and multiply. God wants his people to be fruitful and multiply today. That's why the Bible says children are in heritage of the Lord. It's a blessing to have children. Flip over to Genesis chapter 4. You're in chapter 9 right now. Flip over to chapter 24. Being fruitful and having children in the Bible is always a blessing. It's always a good thing. God wants us to have children. Now, if it's a blessing, why in the world would you not want to have children? If God tells you, hey, this is a blessing, this is good for you, I want you to be fruitful and multiply, why would you say, no, God, you don't know what you're talking about. I don't have enough money for kids. I'm not stable in my job or whatever excuse you might come up with or I just can't handle having kids. Look, God said it's a blessing. God said to be fruitful and multiply. I'm going to have them. I'm not going to take that matter into my own hands. Look at Genesis 24, verse number 60. Elizabeth, sit over there. Abigail, you stop it. Verse number 60 of Genesis 24 says, And they blessed Rebekah. This is when Rebekah is being sent out unto Isaac. They blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister. Be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. What a blessing. They, their blessing to her was to have thousands of millions of children, which obviously it's talking about descendants. They want her to grow in, to have this big nation, this big house. But their blessing is, hey, I, we hope that you are very fruitful. You have lots of children. Your children have lots of children and that you will be the mother of thousands of millions. That's a lot of people. Billions. I mean, that's, that's thousands of millions. That's a blessing. That's a blessing in the Bible. And people are like, oh, I can't believe you have, you have three children. You're going to have a fourth. When are you going to stop? And then there are other people, oh, you've got nine kids. What, don't, don't you know where they come from? It's like, yeah, we do know where they come from. And God said to be fruitful and multiply, and we're following his commandment. And when they blessed Rebekah, they said, be thou the mother of thousands of millions. If that's a blessing, well, that's, that's when I'm going to stop. <laughs> when we reach thousands of millions, okay, honey? That's when we're going to That's when we're going to stop. But this is what God wants for us. He wants us to be fruitful. He wants us to multiply. We need to have the faith to know and understand that this is a blessing from God and that you don't need to, to walk in the, in the sight of this world and think that, what am I going to do? I'm not going to be able to afford children. Yes, you will. God will make a way for you. If you're a hard worker, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, if you're living the Christian life the way that God has laid out for you, God will take care of you. No matter how many children you have, God will not leave you begging bread. God will not leave you hungry. He is your father. And think about how many children he has, and he's able to take care of all of them. So why wouldn't he take care of you and your children if you just listen to his commands and listen to what he says is good and listen to the blessings that the Bible speaks about when having children? There is not one scripture in the entire Bible that tells you to limit the amount of children that you have. There is one event where a man... Um, practices a form of birth control, the only form of birth control that we see where it's, um, I don't really want to get graphic in, in the detail, but it says he, he, he let his seed spill on the ground and, um, and God killed him. 
Now, I don't care what you think. You know, if you want to say what the reasons are why God killed him, look, it's the only example that we have in the Bible about, about birth control. That's it. And, and I think the Bible has the answers to all of life's questions, especially if it comes to the family. And God, how many children should we have? You know how many you should have? As many as God gives you. Because God is the one that opens up the womb and God's the one that closes the womb. The Bible says in um, Genesis 20, Verse number 18, for the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. God closed their wombs. They didn't have to worry about birth control because God's the one who said, you're not going to have any children. And that was a curse. You know why God closed their wombs? It was for Abraham's wife because, you know, she was taken from him and, you know, nothing had happened, whatever. I'm not going to get into the whole story. But that was a curse. That was not good for those people to have their, their, women's wife, their women's wombs closed up. They were not being blessed with having children. But God was in charge of that. Verse, uh, chapter 29, verse 31 says, And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren, which means that he closed Rachel's womb. Rachel was not allowed to have children, but Leah was. Because he saw that, that what was going on with Jacob, he loved Rachel more than Leah. And... Um, it says that Leah was hated, so God blessed Leah. God says, okay, I'm going to open up your womb. I'm going to give you children. I'm going to allow you to have children. And God decided that. This isn't something that they were planning and, and determining, well, you know, now's not the right time. No, God said, now's the right time for Leah to have a child. And now is not the right time for Rachel to have a child. God determined that. Genesis 30, verse 2. It says, And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in God's stead who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? Jacob even knows that God's the one that opens the womb. God's the one that closes the womb. Genesis 30, verse 22 says, And God remembered Rachel and hearkened unto her. He listened to her and opened her womb. So Rachel wasn't having children. Did she go and try to do IVF and try to tamper with, with God's you know, methods of... of childbearing and try to take matters into your own hand or, or go and try to find a surrogate father or anything like that? No. She prayed unto God. God listened. God answered her prayer and God opened up her womb and blessed her because she wanted a child because she knew, knew it was a blessing. 1 Samuel 1.5 says, But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. God is responsible for closing the womb as well as for opening the womb. Verse number six says, And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. Isaiah 44, 24 says, Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. God is the one that opens and closes the womb. We should let him decide for us how many children we should have. We don't need to be taking these matters into our own hands. What if, what if Noah's sons decided, well, no, I don't want to have that many children. I mean, for them, it would probably be a lot, a lot worse consequences. Who knows? But, um, but regardless, we need to understand it's a blessing. We don't want to limit the blessings that we have. And we also don't want to just, just play God, in a sense, by saying, well, I'm going to make sure that we don't have children now, and then I'm going to make sure, try to make sure that we do have them later, and because this is my schedule, and this is when I want it to happen. Well, we need to make sure that we're on God's schedule, and when He wants things to happen. And I praise the Lord for my children, and I'm glad that I understand that they are a blessing, because they truly are. I love all three of my girls, and I love the one that's not even born yet. And I praise the Lord for them because they are a special, amazing thing. And um, hopefully when you have children, you'll understand that blessing and want to have as many as you can and truly be fruitful and multiply. But, you know, the, the, the left-wing liberals will try to, they'll hate on you for that. They'll think, oh, you know, you're leaving such a big carbon footprint and this is so bad for the environment that you're having children that we're just adding more to our population. Don't you know we're overpopulated? Are you in Genesis 8? Go back to Genesis 8 if you're not there. Look at the last verse. Verse 22 of Genesis chapter 8. And then they'll give you all the, you know, they, they love to worship the earth. 
And then you have all this climate change fear mongering with their false science and their lies of people who just want to make money by, by charging carbon taxes because they don't care. You know, the same people that want to charge the carbon taxes like Al Gore, the ones flying around in their jumbo jets and producing way more carbon than any of us ever do. They don't care about the stinking environment. They care about making money. And they know that there's a lot of foolish people out there that, that have their, their priorities screwed up and that, that love the earth more than they love people and have been deceived and tricked into this whole climate change nonsense. And that is all it is. It's, it's a falsehood. It's a fairy tale. Climate change. Oh, yeah, you know what? There is climate change. We've got fall. We've got winter. We've got summer. We've got spring. Yeah, the climate changes. It's called the way the earth has been forever. The climate changes. Sometimes it gets warmer. Sometimes it gets colder. And you're going to say, oh, that's caused by man. No, it's caused by God. And God promised that that's always going to be the way it is. In verse 22 of Genesis chapter 8, he says, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold, and heat, and summer, and winter, and day, and night shall not cease. It's not going to change. It's going to continue to happen this way until God comes and destroys the earth. Because that is going to be the end of the earth. It's not going to be a nuclear war. It's not going to be that we've emitted too much carbon into the atmosphere and now all of a sudden everything's just going to get burned up and the water is going to raise because the ice caps are going to melt and there's going to be all this destruction and everybody on earth is just going to die. That's not going to be the way it plays out. God has told us the way it's going to play out. He's going to come down. He's going to judge the earth. And, you know, again, another reason. Why should we be so worried about the earth when God's going to come and rain fire and brimstone down on the earth? The third of the trees are going to be destroyed. The third of the waters is going to be made bitter. All of these, these, these judgments of God are going to happen. If it's all going to be burned up anyways as an old garment, then why should we really invest so much time caring about it and, and trying to make other rich people even more rich and, and make the poor even more poor by paying more taxes because that's what that's all going to amount to. But God says that, hey, seed time, harvest, cold, heat, summer, winter, it's all going to be there. Don't worry about that change and it's always going to be there. Turn if you want to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 because just to give you one more piece of evidence about how God feels about, you know, this environment or about the animals that, you know, obviously he already destroyed all the animals with the flood. It wasn't just man. Now, was he mad at the animals? No, he was mad at man. Man's the one that brought wickedness and they're doing evil continually. But who suffered as a result? The man and the beasts. God doesn't care about the animals the way he cares about people at all. Not even close. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 9, look at verse number 9, it says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox of or the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. So he's saying here, you know, in, in the law of Moses it says, not to muzzle the ox. The ox is doing the work. It's, it's, it's stamping, it's treading on the corn, and it's, and it's breaking up the corn into powder so they can use it to bake with and stuff. And you have this animal that's just working. It's a work animal. It's an, it's an oxen, and it's, um, you know, it's doing this work, and he's saying you know, not to muzzle the ox. Don't put a bag over its mouth so that it can't eat the corn that it's, that it's breaking up. Okay? And people say, yeah, see, God cares about the animals. But then look at what he says at the end of verse 9. Doth God take care for oxen? Does God care about the oxen? Is that why he's telling you not to do that? Verse 10, he says, Or saith he altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. The only reason God even said that is for our benefit, is to teach us something not to muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. So hey, if you're a laborer for God, if you're a laborer for Christ, you should be partaker of that. You, you know, there's no reason that you shouldn't be able to partake in the, in the fruits of your own labor that you're doing. That's the lesson he's, heard, he's teaching, but he's saying he doesn't care about the oxen. It's not for their benefit. He doesn't care about that. He wiped out all the animals in the flood, and guess what? They're going to get wiped out again 
when the judgment of the earth, when, when the judgment of the world comes down because of man's sakes, they're going to be punished. And it's, it's interesting how all the people who worship false gods and these false idols, what do they end up doing? They worship creatures. They worship the creation. They worship animals. That's why the Hindus, they have their sacred holy cow that, that they can't eat and the Muslims and you know, all of the other face, fake religions of the world. They have their sacred animals that they lift up, that they idolize. Romans 1 tells you a little bit about, about that. And you could read, read more in Romans 1 if you'd like later on. Um, to see where people who worship and serve the creature more than the creator, the, crea the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And, um, and you can see the downward spiral when people exalt and lift up animals more than they do God or they make animals to the status of God. And this is kind of where our culture is going in our society. There's so many weirdos out there that, that you know, the tree huggers and the, and the animal lovers that that's what they worship. They, there is literally this Gaia that this earth worship, people who worship the earth. And it's sick, it's demented, it's twisted, it's reprobate, it's, it's you know, ungodly. We ought not to get sucked into to their way of thinking. Now again, does that mean I think we should just destroy the earth just because we can? No. But am I going to just jump through a million hoops to make sure that, that this earth is preserved as best as it possibly can possibly be preserved, even if that means that my family is going to suffer and my livelihood is going to suffer and everything else? No. No, it's not. I, I don't care as much. I'm going to use the resources of this earth. And I think we all should as, as, a, as a race. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, but let's look in Genesis chapter 8 here. This will be the, the, last, the last verse that we look at. Um, verse number 21. Well, we see, let's look at verse number 20. Because um, we saw all, up to this point, there's a whole timeline of events where Noah releases the dove and everything else. And they get off the ark. God tells them to be fruitful and multiply. Verse number 20 says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So, first thing he does, he builds an altar and says, Okay, and this is why he needed seven of the clean beasts because he was to offer up a sacrifice. And he offered up a sacrifice of every clean beast. He took every of the clean beasts that he had with him and he offered up a sacrifice unto God with each of them. Verse 21, it says, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. It pleased God. It pleased God that Noah obeyed him. He listened. He did everything according to the way God commanded him. Everything God told him to do, Noah did. And we went over this in the previous chapters. Noah did that which was commanded of him by God. Noah offers up the offering the way that God wanted him to. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. That was pleasing unto the Lord. It was accepted unto the Lord. It says, And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Now is he going to smite everything living again? Yes, but not as he has done. He's not going to use a flood to do so. But um, I want to focus on this phrase here in verse 21. This will be the last point that I make um, where it says, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. This is part of our nature, part of our sin nature that we have. The imaginations of our heart, what, what comes out of our heart, it's evil. It's not wicked. We have this fleshly body, and he's talking about our fleshly heart. That, that has these desires and these, and these wants, that it's wicked. From the time we're a child, from, from the time we're a youth, the, the thoughts of our heart is wickedness. Now turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 17, because I want to show you some more verses. I preached an entire sermon about this before, but I want to show you a few of these verses. We're going to start off in Jeremiah 17, because there's a, the, the world's mindset is for people to follow their heart. Do what's in your heart. You know, most people tell you, follow your heart. Hey, if your, heart, your heart's telling you to do this, do it. Follow what your heart says. Oh, your heart's telling you, you know, like, like you really like this person. And, I mean, it can even get so far as people be saying, you know, a married 
woman or a married man is, you know, oh, I don't feel very, uh, you know, I just don't, I'm not loved anymore. My spouse isn't, isn't, isn't taking care of me. They treat me like garbage. And I've met so-and-so, this other person. And, you know, they'll be telling all this to their friend and saying, and, and I just love them so much. And we just have this connection. And I think that that's the right person for me. And I can feel this love in my heart for that person. And the world's advice, the world's advice would say, well, follow your heart. You got to do what's right for you. Maybe you just made a mistake with that other person. Go ahead and divorce them and follow your heart and do what's going to make you happy. And that is pure wickedness. And that is not of God, but that is indicative about the heart that we have. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number 9. The Bible says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Another quote, another warning from the Bible explaining us, hey, the heart is deceitful. It's going to trick you. And it's wicked, desperately wicked, the Bible says. What's in your, your fleshly heart, what your flesh wants to do is wicked. That's why we have our spirit. And if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the new man that's going to help you to, to determine what's right and that gives you those desires of the right things to do and that will, will help you lead you into all truth and into the way that God wants you to walk. But the heart of the flesh is going to lead you astray every time because it's desperately wicked. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 28. We're going to look at a few, few more verses from Proverbs and we're done. And we're going to see the same exact thing. Proverbs 28, right near the end of Proverbs. Proverbs 28, look at verse number 26. It says, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. The Bible says, the book of wisdom says, if you trust in your own heart, you're a fool. That is a foolish way to do things. Don't listen to your heart. Don't, don't decide everything that you make just based on what your heart's saying. He says, you're a fool. He says, but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Proverbs 18. Flip back to Proverbs 18. Proverbs chapter 18. The Bible says in verse number 1 of Proverbs 18, Through desire a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. Again, we see the reference to the fool who says, well, I'm just going to, I need to find what's in my heart. I'm going to let my heart just discover itself. Whatever my heart says, I just, that's how I'm going to find out who I am is just based on what my heart says. That's foolishness, according to the Bible. In Proverbs 19, flip over one more chapter. Proverbs 19, verse number 20 says, Hear counsel and receive instruction, that thou might, mayest be wise in thy latter end. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. There's many things that your heart's going to try to tell you to do and the way to go and everything else, but that's not what's going to stand. You're a fool if you follow your heart. The counsel of the Lord, God's word, that shall stand. This is where you're going to get your wisdom from, and this is how you're going to do what's right. Girls, pay attention. The world, out, I mean, there's movies, there's music, the, th the themes of movies. You have these romance movies, right? It's all about just listening to your heart. Do what your heart says. The music, I mean, there's even a song called Listen to Your Heart. And there's plenty, of, it's a theme of so much music, these ballads and these love songs and everything else. Oh, just do what your heart tells you. No, that's foolishness. Do what God says. Do what the Bible says. Get your counsel from the Lord. Amen. Have, have control and temperance over your heart to be able to, to restrain the, the wicked imaginations that will come from your heart so that you can do that which is right. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. God, I thank you for, for everything we've been able to learn so far through the book of Genesis and the story of the flood. And Lord, we, we believe your words are completely true. We know that there was a flood on this earth that, that en enveloped the entire earth, dear Lord, as you explained it to have happened. 
And um, Lord, help us to continue to learn through our studies. Help us not to be deceived by this world, by the environmentalism and the, and the carbon taxes and, and all the climate change people are trying to, to tell us that, that we're destroying the earth and that we need to pay a bunch of money so that we don't destroy the earth anymore so the rich people can get richer. Dear God, help us not to be deceived by their science that's falsely so-called, dear Lord. And help us also not to get um, deceived by the, the world's way of thinking about just listening to your heart and doing that which feels good to your flesh, dear God. Help us to be able to mortify the deeds of the flesh and to walk in the Spirit on a daily basis, dear God. Help us to win the battle that we have over our flesh every day and um, that we can walk in your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.